night, the opening result world, I got really drunk and the next morning I woke up and I was like, what the? And there was like a bag of cash and I called my casino host <laughs> and I was like, what happened? <laughs> You're listening to Studio 22. Thank you guys so much for watching. We hope you enjoy the video. Please don't forget to leave a like. Subscribe and hit the bell for notifications for more future content. Welcome to Studio 22. I'm Bronco Hearn. I'm here with my co-host, Will Meldman, and we're sitting here with the one and only Jeff Beecher. Jeff is a venture capitalist, a creator of Beecher's Madhouse, and you have Beecher's Media Group as well. Yeah, of course. Dude, busy man. B very busy. How you been, man? It's been a while. What's up, guys? I'm Jeff Beecher. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. With my dear friends. Love yeah. you guys. Yeah, man. Love you too. It's I was very excited. I get asked to be on thousands of podcasts, but this one, you know, jumped right at it. Dude. Got, well, to, got to come see Will's new crib also, you know? Yeah. What do you, th what do you think? I mean, it, it's perfect. I, go I, go I didn't know the address. I Googled a perfect house in the hills and oh. it showed Will's address and house. So, you know. It makes sense. Uh, now everyone knows how to find you. <laughs> yeah, <there> you <laughs> man, that's awesome. Thanks for coming in, man. Uh, we know you're busy, so... Uh, kind of want to dive in and we want to figure out uh what got you started where'd you get started in the in the entertainment industry Ooh, where'd i get started i guess it all started back when i was like 11 years old and i was told i was adopted that really like triggered a lot of crazy thoughts wow and then uh you know um it actually did that's it, like that's like a lot of years of deep therapy yeah, yeah that's, no i have no doubts man yeah, it comes out there um you know i always wanted to be in entertainment grew up on long island it was like a, it was a bubble of like everyone's parents were doctors, teachers, you know, lawyers, or the really rich people that you know, created the toaster strudel or like some stupid thing, you know, and uh, you know, so you had to be in like where I grew up. It was like this cookie cutter. Everyone had to stay there and grow up, and then grow up there, and then do this certain thing. And I just didn't fit in with that. And when I was a kid in high school, I used to throw parties, and I would throw parties at like you know, kids' houses and and make, like, a lot of money. Like, as a kid, making a couple grand a night, you know, that's, like, you know, 10 million for us these days, you know? Yeah, right. Hell yeah. So I was doing that, and then I just I loved socializing, and then I, I took that to a whole other level, and I was promoting, you know, nightclubs in New York at, like, 16, 17, and just had a blast. And then, but I always promised to myself that by 21, I, I wouldn't be in the, I didn't want to be one of those 40-year-old nightclub owners, you know? And... I was doing so well with it at 21, I just stopped. Everyone's like, why are you stopping? I'm like, I just, I don't want to be a 40 year old. If I keep going, it's, it's too good. It's too, it's too, it's too much of a, of a drug. You know, it's like, it was so addicting, like mm. having fun and partying and, you know, everything that comes with it and running, you know, venues like that and nightclubs. And, you know, so I was like, all right, I'm out. And then uh, I didn't go to college, which is a fun fact. Went to one semester of college <laughs> and I, I was in my marketing class and uh, I challenged the, teacher the teacher was, that was talking about doing getting press and sending out press releases i'm like that's not how it works <laughs> <laughs> and then the teacher's like how do you know i'm like because i watch it i watch it go down I'm like you gotta have relationships and you gotta do this and that and the teacher didn't agree with me and i'll leave out the real thing i said you would but anyway so, <laughs> and then yeah so they threw me out of class and i just quit i was at a community college in long island called nasa community college wow yeah, so it lasted about a semester and I quit. I did and, the same actually. Yeah. yeah. I did one semester and then they gave me literally a list of jobs and I always wanted to go into entertainment, a list of jobs. And, and I was like, well, let's see the best option. It was be a doctor, eight years of school, you make 150 grand a year. I was like, don't want to be a doctor. Don't want to spend eight years of my life trying to figure that out. And 150 grand, I'm going to be in how much debt and whatever's going to go on. I just couldn't process it. Someone who didn't have anything. So I literally packed up that week, dropped out, and then just moved on to a buddy's couch and moved to LA. Yeah. That's awesome. And here we are. Yeah. So. No, I didn't move on. A, I didn't move to LA. I had to pick a couple pit stops. I went to Vegas first. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Tell yeah. us about Vegas, man. Vegas was wild. So I started a show called Beecher's Madhouse. And for those of you that don't know, I'm Jeff Beecher, and I my my claim to fame, amongst many of them, is is Beecher's Madhouse, and that was about 16 years of my life. I lived in hotels. I started it. It was in New York on Broadway. The third, I did two off-Broadway shows. The second show I ever did was a small venue um, on 76 and Broadway, and it held 200 people. And the head of Madison Square Garden came and called me up, and I thought it was a joke. And like that shows were on Saturdays, right? And so the two shows on Saturdays. Monday, I get a call from the head of Madison Square Garden. At the time, his name was Joel Parisman. He's a great guy. 
he's like, Jeff, Joel Parisman, you know, I run Radio City and I'd love to have you come do, we wanted to start doing comedy at, at the, the theater next to the garden it's called now, but back then it was called, I think it was called the Paramount. Hmm. And I was like, okay. And he's like, no one knows who you are and, and they, everyone, my staff thinks I'm crazy, but I think you can sell out. I'm like, I can't, I'll personally sell individually every one of those tickets, I know that many people. He's like, I know you will. He's like, so I go to his office and he's like, what do you need? I'm like, I need billboards all over the city. He's like, but you told me you're going to sell the tickets yourself. I'm like, no, I just need it for the, my ego, for my pictures, you know, <laughs> standing in front of the billboards. I have all these really cool pictures of like Beat Your Live, which wasn't even the name of the show. And I just did it to like to have pictures in front of billboards around the world. That's great. So it was really cool. And then uh, we sold out, a great show. And then right after that show, I booked a theater on Broadway every Saturday called The Supper Club. And it was just beautiful. It held 1,200 people. It was... Uh, it was really, really just this gorgeous, like you felt like you were walking into a theater that was 100 years old. And it was just like, and it was actually, and it was just refurbished every, you know, a couple of years. And that's where we started doing comedy shows. So it was comedy with a DJ, with dancers, and one little person. And then we were hired to do the Grammys in 2002 and set up like a Beecher's Madhouse experience on the carpet of the viewing party next to the Grammys, which was at the Madison Square Garden, and they were at the Paramount. And then we hired all these acts, and thousands of acts showed up, and then now we have all like database of acts. So we're like, oh, let's invite them all to the show. It'll be fun having them run around. And then one of them snuck on stage. His name was Leonard the Magnificent, who turned out to be, I don't know if you even remember him, the, the, the sword swallower, always wear silver, or the hula hoop guy yeah. from Beechers. So he was our one of our stars for even when we do pop-ups now, we always use him, he's the best. But he snuck on stage and I'm in the back of the room, I'll never forget, I was like sitting with a couple celebrities that, in New York and just schmoozing and all of a sudden this guy goes on stage and I'm like, what the hell? And I start running to the stage and by the time I got to the stage, he had a full standing ovation and the room was going crazy and, and his performance was so unbelievable. Wow. Everyone's like, you're a genius, dude. where'd you find this guy? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I was like, how the hell did he, I'm like, the, and then he convinced everyone that I said to let him go on stage and he totally lied and like snuck his way on stage and wow. it was incredible and everyone loved it. So I was like. It's one way to do it. Yeah, I was like, wow. Yeah. I'm like, this is really good. Maybe let's we'll start doing some of these, it's called variety, you know, variety acts. Mm -hmm. So I started doing some of these vaudeville stuff. So I started hiring more of the vaudeville and then the room got so crazy that the comedians couldn't even perform. And these are the best comedians in the world, world like you know Jeff Ross and like all my best friends. And yeah. the room was just too nuts, so we had to stop doing comedy. And because it was, it was, it was not that it was more fun. It just became easier and more of a party with the variety acts. And then we moved to Vegas um, a year later after we did every Saturday for about a year and a half on at the Supper Club, and then we went to the Hard Rock. And I got to work for the Morton family, which was incredible. And like, yeah. they put us, when I say us, the entire cast up in the hotel. And then that was crazy because there was like little people were like eating room service, like off trays outside people's rooms. Oh like it God. was uh, on top of the thousand uh, stories I can tell. It was just a wild time in Vegas, 2003 to 2008 at the Hard Rock. That was like wow. the magic days, you know? I We had Matthew Morton on the other day. Oh, really? And yeah. we, obviously we didn't make the connection about that, but like I'd love to get you two in a room also. And like, well, I mean, Matt at the time, I mean, he was- He must have been know, young. Yeah, yeah, he was really young. He was, yeah. he was a kid in his teen, early teens then, but- Yeah. Yeah, Harry, rest in peace, you know, my best friend that passed away, his brother. And, uh, you yeah. know, Harry literally, Harry, they made, he's, him and his dad are the main reason why I'm famous and I have everything- that I have today, you know, they they got behind me, they got behind the show, and and we killed it, in, you know, in return. We, you know, we did an incredible job for the Hard Rock, and but it was, you know, it was fun. That was the, the thing, you know, it was fun. Like you woke up every day, you woke up, and I loved waking up. I loved getting ready to go to work. I loved creating and filling the room and doing all the things. You know, I started out as doing stand up, and when I started producing these shows, I quickly turned to producing and emceeing the show because it was more fun to me than doing stand up because stand up would take five years, six years, seven years till you really hone, you know, your, your voice and get used to being on stage. Sure. When producing, I was just, it was a natural for me. I was, I was a natural born, you know, producer, take a hundred checks on a checklist and make it all happen at once, you know, yeah. marketing, promoting, creating, getting the right people in the room, you know, 
putting all the right people together, making sure everyone has fun, taking care of everyone, you know, making sure that everyone can trust the environment and it's a safe environment, even though there's a thousand people in the room, sometimes 4,000 people in the room, depending on where we were doing it. Yeah. And, and I did that for, you know, 20 years. Wow. I mean, that's a skill set. straight years yeah. of doing it, but the, the last four has been pop-ups. Like, you know, we did uh, Katy Perry's New Year's, for example, at the Resort World. When she launched her show, we did uh, a private party for her after with the guys from The Box. And uh, that was really cool. I wasn't even there at Corona. Oh, wow. So I didn't even make it, but it was uh, Katy Perry themed. You know, we just produced it with like the performers and it was really cool. It was like the beach. I mean, you have the two best. I don't, I don't know if for... For those of those, for those people out there that don't know the box, the box, my creative director Randy Weiner, who co-created Beecher's Madhouse with me, um, after I moved to Vegas, went and opened the box with Simon Hammerstein. Okay. So we have uh, we're all family and friends and love each other, and this was like the first time in all these years we worked together on something that was really cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Speaking yeah. of uh, Resort World, I was going to ask if that was when you uh, were winning big over there, man. Well, no, I won, <laughs> obviously I, I won a bunch of times there. I've lost a bunch of times, but I won. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not a crazy, ga- like I've always gambled and I was always lost my whole entire life. And it was like God gave it ba- all back to me in one like summer. It was really weird. It was the opening night of Resort World and my buddy is the president, Scott Sabella. And he's awesome. He's like, you know, he's a mentor to me and he was the president of the MGM when I was there and the Mirage. And he's just, he's, he's like one of the last of those type of like just amazing presidents in Vegas that like really get it and know how to do old school and new school and combine the both and run those massive, you know, six, 7,000, 8,000 hotel room properties. It's a, it's a, it's a skill set. And anyway, so, you know, I helped him do the opening and all my friends, you know, Paris got the DJ and, you know, we had a blast and we all came in and, at the same time, um, the guys from the box were doing the creative directing for Usher's show. It was like Usher came to the show and I saw them too. And that's how we like we connected and did the thing with for Katie. A cool. little backstory there. But anyway, oh. um that night I got really drunk. And for those of you that don't know me, I, I lost two hundred and fifty pounds. One of my claim to fame is my health journey. And when I was doing Peter's Madhouse, my show it changed, you know, it was a, a 20 year cycle. So you had to reinvent yourself a lot and things change a lot. And the, the last version of the show, the last couple of years from like 2000, you know, 12, 13 to 16, I just became morbidly obese. Like I was always fat, but it became, you know, 350, 400, 440 pounds and it just got out of control. So I lost, you know, I stopped doing the show um, for a while and I started focusing on health and I got really healthy and, and, and the end result there was 250 pounds of loss. Yeah, yeah. So I, mean, I still drink every once in a while, like, you know, once a month, once every two months. And, but I like plan it. It's like a, it's a big thing. Cause I know if I'm going to drink, I'm going to be a mess. And You're going to enjoy it. Right. And I can't just drink one glass of wine. So anyway, so that night, the opening result world, I got really drunk and, Next morning I woke up and I was like, what the? And there was like a bag of cash and I called my casino host and I was like, what happened? And he was like, he's like, I don't know, you won a lot. I'm like, I don't think so. Like there's a bag of cash next to me. I know it's got, let me count it. And I'm like, can you call and see how much I owe you guys? I'm like, I definitely owe you money because there's no way I can one, not remember it. <laughs> and uh, and like, this is so embarrassing even talking about this, but I, I, I have this problem where I can't lie. So like I just have to, you ask the story, so I got to tell the truth. So anyway, he calls me back and he's like, um, I don't remember the exact number. So I had 250 and so it's 50, it's three, four. So it was like, I don't know, say it was 550. I don't remember the exact number, but say it was 550. He goes, you got 550 in the hole or something like that or in the bank. I go, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I owe you guys 550,000. He's like, no, no, we owe you 550,000. I'm like, what? well, there's 250 here. <laughs> so that would make it 800. He's like, yeah. And then like you gave Usher money. I'm like, I was gambling with Usher. We won money. We split it. Like I know it was the, it was the craziest thing. There was like a crowd around us apparently. And like oh everyone cheering us on like a hundred deep. And I was like, whoa, this is nuts. So yeah, I ended up winning a lot of money that night. That was the biggest time I, most everyone ever. And then that happened through what I refer to as my roaring twenties, a series of four or five months of, going to Vegas after being locked up. I had really bad OCD. Mm. And people, under, people, most people think the word OCD and they think, oh, you know, I wash my hands a lot and you know, I'm really organized. But bad OCD is like Howard Hughes in the, in the movie Aviator with Leo DiCaprio. Like 
Yeah. I didn't. I wasn't peeing in cups, but it was pretty bad. There's different kinds of OCD. Yeah. 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 I locked my myself in the house for three months. It's it's a mental disorder, you know, and yeah. you got to beat it. And I had to like focus on it and beat it. But I had bad OCD, so I was locked up for two years in my house and didn't go anywhere. Pretty much. Uh, no, I mean, especially with COVID, right? It's yeah. we all kind of respond and react differently. But there's, I mean, it was real. It was. Yeah. A very tangible reason of like why to isolate. Yeah. So, so like yeah. I think it was maybe I mean I was, I didn't stay in that whole time, but the first part of COVID I was cuckoo. So maybe it was that three or four months. Like I literally didn't leave the house. I was wearing hazmat suits. Like it was it was I was mentally ill. Like it was a it yeah. was a problem. I mean I spoke about that. I, I have a depression. I've grown up with depression, clinical depression, and and. I went into a deep dive, man, like lo- lost my health, lost my drive to do anything. Uh, completely depressing. I had to work myself out of that too, I think towards the end of it. And it's, it's, fu- it's not easy, you know? Well, my doctor said he wanted to put me on, I think it was Prozac or something that you, that goes with OCD. I don't know. One mm. of those, those pills. I'm like, doc, you know me, I don't want to do the pills and it'll lead to others and i will get off them. And he goes, well, then you got to work out. Mm. And he goes, you got to work out, you got to get endorphins, you got to pump it, and you got to do two hours a day. So I worked out four hours a day every day, I lost 60 pounds, and I was the lightest that I've ever been. Wow. Right now I'm about 15, 20 pounds higher than that. But um, that's only because I had some recent medical issues, but I'll lose it again. Yeah, you know, and I'll get 100%. Lower. And, and now, now I'm starting weight training, which I haven't done ever. I've always been doing cardio. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really excited for that. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm a big fan of weight training. So uh, yeah. yeah. And it's for those of you who don't know what he looks like, he's like, um, what superhero would you compare yourself to? Thor? It's got to be I Thor. hear that, yeah. I hear that a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally, he's like, he's like that. He's like one of the no. Klitschko brothers. <laughs> but it goes into, for me also, you know, it's you're, like your doctor saying, get you moving, get your endorphins going. For me, I didn't, I wasn't told that, but I knew from the feeling I got from working out it was the only time I really felt healthy when I was young. So I would tell people, you can tell how depressed I am because the bigger I get, the more depressed I am um, at that time in my life until... I did end up yeah, healthy. Yeah, even know? right now, like I'm trying to balance, you know, I have so much going on with work and I'm trying to balance and make sure that like, you know, I'm asleep by midnight every night and yeah. I'm up early working out, whether it's cardio or weights or but now it's going to be a combination of and then I get that second workout in because that's where I've always fallen off. Every time everything's perfect, which it is right now, mm. my social life, it's like, that's when things start getting screwed up. It's always been with my career, even like my career yeah. is going perfectly. Everything's perfect. And then I have a mental breakdown. Everything's perfect. Something goes wrong. And, yeah, sorry. you know, so it's like right now everything's great. So I'm like, I don't want anything to go wrong. Mm. You know, so I really want to balance, which I always have a problem of doing. And I'm this now I'm really got it down to where I'm going to pull this one. We can, I'll come back and talk to you guys in six months or a year. You'll be really ha- proud of me. Dude. Be like, he did yeah. it. I can't wait he, to see it. He worked out. He's got yeah. the abs. He's got the, the pecs. He's got it all. And, yeah, man. And his business is thriving. You know, we just launched a fund. Um, it was announced on TechCrunch uh, with the D'Amelio family. So, you know, I put a lot of my money into it. So it's, it's, it's you know, a great opportunity for me to now, instead of being in the weeds with like my company, Beecher Media Group, which, so after Beecher's Madhouse, um, I needed something to do, literally. And I'm, you know, from 20 years of networking in Hollywood and knowing every celebrity and their mother and their sister and their hairstylist and their attorney and their, you know, accountants. And you just, you know, all everyone, you've done parties for them, you've hosted them. It was just an easy segue to go into doing deal flow. And I got trained by the best corporate guys in the world, literally the best, the, like the best of the best. And I loved it. And uh, I did it for a while. I started one of the, one of the first companies I worked with was Airbnb. Yeah. Um, and their, their 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 whole team is just so incredible. Like the the CMO, the CFO, the CEO, and I learned so much doing that that it's like it it it, it created another business for me, which I didn't know I was going to do called Beecher Media Group. So I started mm-hmm. consulting for tech companies and advising tech companies, and we, you know I did really you know some of the best companies in the world from Airbnb to Lyft. Um, currently, I'm working with Gemini. Which is uh, owned by the Winkle bosses and well, owned by a lot of people now. We just did a big raise, raised four hundred million dollars, which was publicly announced. Wow. And uh, yeah, and the the company's incredible. It's the core values of them are amazing. The brothers that run it are incredible, and just the whole the entire company, like everyone's just great people. And that's that's all you really need, you know. When you're happy with work and you're happy with who you're working with, that's 
you know, you, you're, you're happy to wake up in the morning, you know. With uh, Gemini, are you uh, into crypto? Do you? Yeah, so, you know, representing the company, um, Gemini owns Nifty Gateway, which also is is the premier NFT. Um, yeah. It's like the Sotheby's of NFTs, you know. Mm. They, they, they're, it's an incredible company. And Gemini owns that as well. So I dabble in NFTs. It's, if you do NFTs, I tell anyone, you got to do it and you got you to gotta buy projects you believe in. It's the same with crypto. You got to buy. Mm. I've done it all. Like I've done, you know, r- running the the waves and getting in and out, and I've lost a lot of money doing that. And I highly suggest you don't do that to anyone. If you're buying a project you believe in, buy it to hold it, and that's it. You know, or or if you think it's going to go up, and you, but just don't trade it because you, if you're not a trader, it's like it's like being a stock trader. If you don't know a stock trade, you're not going to start stock trading your money or trading options. You lo- you lose all your money. Yep. And I've done that also stupidly. You know, I'm not a, I'm not an options trader, but I've lost a lot of money trading options. You know, like yeah. so you learn from your mistakes, and I learned my my mistakes personally with with trading crypto was um, was I was trading instead of buying and holding. When I when I bought and held Ethereum, I made a lot of money. You know, even the end of last year, I sold for, to pay taxes. I, I made a lot of money with it. But every, every wow. time I went off of that path of buying and holding in good projects, and I traded, I lost money. So my wow. my advice to anyone is that once you get into crypto. I love this space personally. Um, you know, if you're going to buy something, buy it because you believe in the project and hold it. Like if it's a Bitcoin or an Ethereum or something that's, you know, like that, that's a real project that's backed by real people and you can really understand it and you understand what you're doing, then invest in it. Otherwise, don't, yeah. don't, I wouldn't play with the doji coins and, you know, the quote unquote shit coins out there because you, you really get burned with those badly. Yeah. Um, that's it. But yeah, I love the crypto space. I love Web three, blockchain, all the buzzwords. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's 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 the new wave of everything. Everything's gonna be run on that stuff. So yeah, it's true. just the beginning too. Like people feel like, oh, it's two years. You know, the last few years have been really hot for crypto and for NFTs, and they think it's like, oh, the bubble burst or the bubbles are like about to burst. No, this is just this is ju- literally just the beginning. It's like the shifting of this. Is my opinion, anyway. I feel it's like it's a shifting when like currency changes every couple hundred years or every couple thousand years is that major of a deal yeah. so I yeah know. i mean it, it definitely from anyone's perspective i would say and especially even looking at the way banks are adopting it all these different companies are adopting it bringing them in crypto is just the decentralized you know currency yeah. is it's the way it yeah, has dude, to be I mean, dude you gotta do it right like I, I talk to kids all the time and these kids are like don't even pay taxes they think it's like oh <laughs> it's something like you the gut you have to pay like all right okay you so you have, you have it on a cold flash drive or a hard drive or whatever they where they keep their 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 you know their yeah. tokens i'm like oh well, how are you gonna get you gonna go buy a house with a flash drive like it's just like it's just stupid and the but the, you know in the kids defense also a lot of these kids they're just young they don't understand it you know, but yeah, the, they've never had money before. Yeah, but the IRS is going to teach them very quickly that <laughs> yeah, they, they, you got to pay taxes. Not a lesson you want to learn. Yeah. yeah. So for me, trading, I've learned my lessons. I've lost, I've lost money. I've made money. Luckily, I made more money than I lost, and I now just stick to like really good projects. And, and you know, it's great. Yeah. So that's that's my story with crypto. Um, How has that translated into producing? Because I know you've produced tons of well, shows. Producing, and films you know, and- producing is my passion. You know, it's like. Like live theater, I mean, I've done several thousand um, live theater events. You know, I, I've toured the country. I've done eighty-one city tour twice over two and a half years. You know, I did my my shows in Vegas, New York, and L.A. Um, so it's just it's just about hours, right? Like they say that Ma- what's it? Malcolm Gladwell says over ten thousand hours. 10, you're an expert, hours, right? Yeah. So I've had what hundred thousand hours. I don't know what the number is, but of producing live theater. There's nothing harder than live theater. Nothing. Yeah. Decades. Nothing, yeah. Nothing is harder than live theater. And if you can do that, you can literally do anything. So, flip, you know, high, getting involved with a production crew that's experts at you know using cameras and you know turning it to TV or movies or is, is just easy. So I got into producing when people needed things. So where usually I would just hook things up. I'm like, oh wait, I want to. I'm gonna move to California. Let me build up my IMDb. Let me get into producing. So, I would help out with a movie, or I'd help out with a couple. First, it was a couple specials. Mariah Carey did a Christmas special, so we get my, my venue. Boom, you know, I'm a producer on that. Um, Pitbull needed. He was doing his first New Year's special with uh, Enrique, and it was in Florida. My friend was launching a hotel, uh, Jay Pritzker, and he. Uh, he was launching a Thompson hotel. So we did a whole thing with them and helped coordinate that. Boom, I produced that. 
you know, and then the gong show came online and, um, my buddy at ABC and then some of the producers, everyone's like, this has got to be Beecher. It's like, you know, literally it's a variety show. It's everything. So like that was my first TV series. That's a lot of work though. A lot of work. And there's a lot of people involved in that stuff. It was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. But I also decided after that, that the next thing I want to do is going to be me. You know, I, 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 I helped out again with a couple of different productions along the way with, uh, some big names, big people involved, but the next thing I do is going to be the Beecher documentary. Nice. But the Beecher's Madhouse. And then once that's, you know, my, my goal has always been with that is I want, I want to win awards. I want to win awards at the festivals and I want to win an Oscar. You know, I want to win awards for that story because the story is really deep and it's really an incredible roller coaster of highs and lows. And I love telling it and I'm not ashamed of any of it, both the good and the bad. So once that's a hit, then, you know, let somebody play me and then we'll have a docuseries, mm. you know. Yeah, I love that idea. That, that, that's kind of, that's what I want to do with my, my last production. I mean, it's such an American dream story. Not to like sound cliche, but it, it really is, right? Just climbing the ranks of entertainment and live production and theater. I mean, it's fascinating. And Yeah, and it's hard. You know, none of, nothing, you know, I wish we had hours to talk about it instead of an hour, but like nothing's easy, you know? Like all of it's hard. It's constant work. It's constant, you know, networking and working and learning your craft and learning how to be a better person and learning how to lead and, you know, changing with the, your environment. Like, you know, let me look at the Corona is the best example. Like everything changed. The world changed, power changed, everything shifted. People moved, it just, everything changed and you got to change with it. You know, when Corona happened, I, I was working for governments and it was right after Airbnb and I was doing travel for governments. Like I worked for Dominican Republic and, like the Can't, tourism boards kind of? Not even, just it was departments set up to to help with making destinations hot and cool and popular. Exactly what I do with Airbnb. But for the governments, it was really cool. And I just started it. I mean, it was I was killing it. It was like three months into it, into 2020. So about six months into doing that stuff. And then Corona hit. Uh. And the first, the first line item to go in force majeure is, you know, entertainment, marketing, and yep. celebrity travel. So... You know, and then I, I so you got to you got to adapt. You know, so um, a company outdoors. Yes, I started working with. I worked with them for about a year. Um, they're like, you, you know, it's like the Airbnb of our RVs. Mm. Right? Oh yeah. So like, if you want an RV for the weekend, so I, I knew that was going to go big, and the company's killed it, and it's doing amazing because people started traveling locally, and they wanted to, you know, not be around the people, and you know, and it became a thing. So was it easy to make those transitions between you know working with the government, working with the RV company? It's or? just different. I'm just used to it. You yeah, know, it's yeah. like it's like when you when you're touring, you never know what the venue you're going to move into next is going to be. So it's like this is easy. These are professional yeah. companies with you know incredible people running them. So it's just like all right, what's next? What's new? Cool. Yeah, you show know. up and get it done. Do you have any uh, any tools? Because I, I man, I love watching you on Instagram and your happy and healthy journey, and and it literally it inspires me half the time or all the time actually. <laughs> like doing the juices, the workouts, all that stuff. Is there, yeah, you know, the, the biggest tools and the reason why I always do it and my friends always make fun of me and wherever I go, everyone goes, happy, healthy, happy, healthy. I do it because <laughs> I put it out there because it, it keeps me in check, right? Like mm -hmm. you going right now, you inspire me. That'll keep me in check. So tonight, yeah. you know, or when I leave here and I'm, I haven't eaten yet today, I've been so busy at work. Like I had a piece of bread. So maybe mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat that second piece of bread I wanted to eat on the way out today, you know? But when I'm in my zone and, you know, I mean, it's probably everyone. Everyone has their different zone foods and meals and tricks. But mm -hmm. my the best that I have is intermittent fasting. I wake up in the morning, but I do it differently. I don't consider celery juice or lemon water. That's great. Um, food. Some yeah. some people say, oh, you can't. But I'll have a celery juice first thing. I'll drink maybe a green juice or two before lunch, and then I start my lunch at twelve or one, and I eat the, like a breakfast. I'll have like eggs. Um, I'm not vegan anymore. That's a big, mm. big deal. I did. I was vegan for five years. -ish. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How'd you feel when you were vegan? Um, I actually felt better than I do now. Wow. So I might go back to vegan. It's just a big decision. Yeah. And it's and a big it, commitment, right? It, it's a big commitment. It's a big statement. You can't be like, you know, I, like right now I dabble in and out. I try to, to eat mostly vegan, but you know, mostly with, I don't eat cheeses or I stay away from cheeses. I'll leave some vegan cheese, but yeah. anyways, back to my routine. It's lemon water, celery juice, first thing in the morning. And then green juices, and then I start eating at 12 or 1 o'clock. That's great, man. And, yeah. you know, I'll try to keep it 
and cap it out at like six or seven and then done. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of intermittent fasting, honestly. Uh, yeah, no, it worked. And I've, I've yeah. lost the most weight doing that or maintained. Like even if you eat a little crappy, you know, if you keep that yeah. schedule, you don't really gain weight. I feel like it's the same thing with producing with a lot of businesses. You know, it's, it, there's no one way to do something. Usually when it comes to like entertainment, for example, or even getting in shape, it's what's going to work for you and what's going to make you, what works for your body? How do you, how do you tick? Like what cravings do you have? People don't know the stuff like having OCD is a totally different uh, thing than somebody else to deal with. So if you're just trying to follow the simple cookie cutter plan, it's not necessarily going to work as far as longevity. So it's cool to hear, you know, what you do and how you do it and, and what helps you stay consistent, you know, cause I've tried everything, man. I have tried everything to figure out what works for me. And then finally I'm like, no, I do feel better when I eat, you know, four or five meals a day and I work out in the morning fasted and uh, you find your little tricks and you kind of, and that's kind of what you do. You just build it as you go. But dude, you, the amount of weight you've lost, how you've been able to stay consistent, you know, and even going through the ebb and flows of life, it's, it's badass, dude. And I really respect it. Thanks, but I appreciate yeah. it. You know, and there's other little tricks. They're, they're cheesy and they're corny. Like I got my grateful journey, my grateful journey, my grateful journal, um, you know, this is a really good trick and this is good for like, if people are slightly depressed or, or clinically depressed or need to get into a routine, you know, you buy them on Amazon. Um, it's a daily journal and it's your grateful book and you just write the things you're grateful for. And it literally in 30 days, it totally either sets your patterns or turns around your head. Wow. And it worked, it works all the time for me. And every time I fall off of it and like I slip on it, that's when things get a little sloppy. I get yep. back on it. And I just take this journal with me and it just, I write in it all the time. And it's just, here's what I'm grateful for. Here's what I could have done better for the day. And just, it takes five minutes. It's the yep. easiest thing in the world. I found with that too, there's something about, uh, cause I've done that as well. And I'm a big fan of it. And I'm a big fan of writing just in general, but something about pen to paper, not just texting or whatever it is, but for me, pen to paper, there's like, it no, connects there's like, better. There's psychological reasons for the brain and a yeah. whole bunch of stuff that's way yeah, yeah. above my third grade <laughs> level. Well, uh, I dropped out of college too. So I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> But yeah, no, but it works. And it's like, you know, and that's it. And then cardio, you always got to be moving, you know? Yep. When I'm in zone, I get a minimum 10,000 steps a day, no matter what. Wow. Yeah, even if I don't get a workout in, I get 10,000 steps. Dude, that's awesome, man. You know, when I'm really in the zone, I'll go to 20. Um, you know, I'm about to go on a 90 day, like hardcore, put on social, put myself out there so that I'm accountable, mm -hmm. you know, workout plan. So, yeah, that's that was one thing I found, you know, even being in front of with social media or being in the public eye or whatever it is, is I never realized how many people are watching or how many people in your immediate life uh, it affects and you can be consistent with that and exactly playing off of their expectations or, or whatever it is uh, to keep you accountable. It's huge, man. Yeah, I, I even started a charity for, um, um, I don't know if it's called that, it's either the Jeff Beecher Foundation or the Happy Healthy Foundation, I don't remember what, and then it wanted to being maybe it's DBA or they have both names. I don't know, but mm. we pay for stomach surgeries and wow. we all, it's, it's, it's the charities for to pay for stomach surgeries for people that can't afford it. And we also do health education, which we haven't started yet, but I just haven't had time to really dive into this, but that's a big passion of mine because it's awesome. Yeah. Because it's, you know, people don't realize that people think obesity is like, Oh, come on, you know, don't be lazy, get up and run. It's, it's so much more. It really yeah. starts with mental. When people ask me how I lost the weight, I said, I started with therapy. Because that's the real answer, you know. Yeah. When I when I October 2014, I reached a peak of weight, and I, I we guesstimated it was around 440, and I checked into this vegan camp in Florida, and I was there for 30 days. I lost like 50, 60 pounds or something, but I I went, started going to therapy, which I never did, and it was just one session. Boom! I remember going in. It was all dark outside, and. I was just angry and I remember coming out and birds are chirping and like leaves are falling and I was happy. And I was like, wow, that was good. It was a good session. It worked. And then the weight just flew off. That's awesome. Yeah. And then that's what, that's what I tell people. You got to like, you know, figure out therapy, meditation, guided meditation. Like the stuff works. Yeah. It really works. It's, it's a pain and it's like, it's, it's very time consuming. Like you can get caught up in like the whole health bubble and be spending six, eight hours a day on health stuff. And you're like, how do you earn a living? Yeah. But, you know, so you got to figure it out. I mean, it's like you got to get up a couple hours earlier. You got to work on it, especially if you have problems. If you have mental problems, you have physical problems, you're overweight, you know, you did that to yourself. So now you got to help your body fix it. Yeah. It takes time to get there and it takes time to undo you know, it too. People say like, oh, you're too extreme. Like I'm about to go 90 days of hardcore 
like pure health. And I'm starting that in about two weeks, or maybe mm. three, because of my travel schedule. But I'm gonna be based in my house. I'm, I got the cryo machine I ordered. Like I got the oxygen machine. Like yeah, I'm gonna be hardcore. And it's, maybe it's extreme for some people, but I also beat my body up for 20 years. You know, mm. drinking vodka Red Bulls and you know eating pizzas three, four nights a week. You know, it was like I really, I really hurt my vehicle, my body. So I gotta yeah. do it, do it overly, do it right before it so it doesn't fail on me. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also impressive, like you know, doing all those incredible healthy habits and making that transformation while you're running companies and finding a founding a VC firm and just working with so many different people. I mean, that's like the hardest thing for me at least is work and health balance, right? Like finding that balance between the two, but to be as busy as you are and to focus on health so much. I mean, it's impressive. Thanks buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. And uh, what can we uh, look forward to you or look forward to from you? Well, I have a, a new business I'm starting um, in about a year, which we're putting together now. Mm. Can't talk about it yet, but it's, right. it's really exciting. We'll get you it, back it, in. It gets, it gets all my juices flowing, all, and it's entertainment based. It's making people laugh, giving people c- great content, and it's really wholesome. It's really clean. It's fun for the whole family, but it's also like you like you can go on a date. You can go yourself. You can take your grandma. Like it's mm. it's gonna be a really cool new form of entertainment. Um, it's been done certain ways, but not the way that we're doing it. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be really cool. It's yeah. going gonna to attach, you know, real life brick and mortar to the metaverse. And Wow. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's well, very exciting. We'll get you in on a, in a year and talk about it again. Done. That's awesome, man. Looking forward to it. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming on. All right. Thank you, Beecher. All right. Thank you, buddy. All Appreciate right. it. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to drop a like if you enjoyed the video. And subscribe and hit the bell for a whole lot more to come. Thanks for tuning in to Studio 22.